Boy, that's that's so clearly stated, Kim, um, and that's that's what's missing. People won't; uh, th- they will immediately go to, like you mentioned, <clears throat> the things that have certainly been used by God for the furtherance of the gospel um, throughout the world in, in missions and evangelism, and and it's it's ergo. We are therefore the new Israel. We are, yeah. you know, the city on that's the hill. That's the leap you can't make. No. We're going to talk in a moment about the biblical uh, support for this doctrine of two kingdoms, that Christ's kingdom and the kingdoms of this world are things distinct. We have a dual citizenship. But before we get there, it's interesting that although that doctrine is especially identified with Luther and also Calvin, as we'll see uh, in just a moment, that even in Scandinavia, this is the, the king of Sweden, uh, put Bible verses on the on the canons mm. uh, that he shot at Catholic countries. You had the Catholic League <laughs> <That's nice. laughs> versus the Protestant League, and so the religious wars between nations became a right. war between denominations. Mm. And then you have the Puritans coming to New England and setting up what they called a Holy Commonwealth, mm-hmm. which again is a confusion of the kingdoms. Isn't it strange that despite the very clear teaching, not only of the Reformers, but of the Lutheran and Reformed confessions on this point, that nations continued to grab the mantle of Christendom just as as they had before the Reformation. It's always been hard for a Christian people to live in the midst of those who persecute them and those who try and uh, deceive them, like Israel back in Canaan with the Canaanites still residing nearby and always being pulled toward Baalism and, and Ashtoreth and all. Christians, I think, have a, have a sense of self-preservation by wanting to congregate together and formulating a government that protects them yeah. and that manifests some kind of civic righteousness. And a lot of times that goal is so easily tweaked to include the church as somehow connected to the state. And that's all. You, on the one hand, you want to, you, I would like to live in a community where people were of like mind and where the things I thought were important were protected and honored. Yes. And, and I mean, there's a real attraction to that. And, and you'd want to go, you know, take over Vancouver Island and make it the, the reformed, you know, Canton. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a part of me that would like to do that. Didn't they do that in Grand Rapids? No. Uh-huh. Try. Yeah. <laughs> Yet on the other hand, just the very idea that we want to do that shows a little bit of our sinful, sinful propensity to be afraid of the world and to be reluctant to exercise our role as salt and light in the world around us, where not everybody is on the same page, where there are pagans are living next door to me, where their ideology is constantly before my eyes, and I have to constantly work and respond against it. And it's but, also but, a collective narcissism to, to say, probably. I want, you know, yeah. uh, just, just from, a Reformed community, just a Lutheran yeah. community, just a... I mean, isn't there a lot of narcissism sure. in that too? We like to to two tables of the law. We yeah. will always, we will always, it will always manifest itself in our interactions with with others, whether yeah. it's denominationally, whether it's ethnically, culturally, whatever. Yeah. We, yeah. we want to yeah. be yeah. like with those who are like us. You're listening to the White Horse Inn, and we're discussing the question of political temptation, especially now that we've entered a new election year. We'll be back right after this break. Welcome back to the White Horse Inn. I'm Michael Horton, and we're talking about political temptation. It's really interesting, looking back at the, the history of it, without going into all kinds of uh, examples, just a, a couple here, how the shining city on the, on a hill, that, that ideal of America as this, this holy commonwealth, really attracted Anglicans, Congregationalists, Presbyterians, Quakers, a whole variety of uh, of different people, so that the co- colonies really became united, in part at least, around this notion of not only a holy commonwealth, but a, of a holy nation. Right, right. Well, remember, in, in fairness to those folks, they all had been persecuted in their home before they left. So there, sure. there, there's a sense in which they're coming... Which and, you'd and think would make haven. them even more nervous yes, about... But exactly, but instead <laughs> it just makes them more vulnerable to... Allying with other Christians and seeking to have a quote unquote Christian secular, secular government. Yeah, the New, the New England Puritans, you know, supposedly came over for uh, for po- political liberty so that they could worship God quote unquote in freedom. Mm-hmm. But they wanted to worship God according to His Word, is what they said. And uh-huh. 
Baptists, for example, didn't worship God according to his word. They didn't mm-hmm. baptize yeah. infants and include. So Roger Williams and yeah. other Calvinistic Baptists were exiled from Massachusetts. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Was it Rhode Island? Rhode Island. Yeah, to, there yeah we go. to Rhode yeah. Island from yeah. Massachusetts. Yeah. So it's a remarkable thing. To, to be disciplined in church is one thing, quite yes. proper for a church to do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to to be exiled from the state is yes. quite a another thing. Here is okay, so some examples. Samuel Sherwood, seventeen thirty to seventeen eighty three he lived. He preached a sermon uh, on January seventeenth, seventeen seventy six that quite literally rallied the revolutionary troops with a sermon whose title tells the story. Try to put this on a bulletin. <laughs> the church's flight into the wilderness. An Address on the Times, Hmm. containing some very interesting and important observations on scripture prophecies, showing that sundry of them plainly relate to Great Britain and the American colonies and are fulfilling in the present day. The lion with its cubs. Mm -hmm. Was was there some of that British British Israelite stuff in there? Yeah. Huh? Using well, here is what he says: using Revelation 12 as his text, with patriots like John Hancock uh, in the congregation. He'd be sitting here listening to this. Sherwood thundered that Rome, the dragon, the headquarters of tyranny and persecution. This is an Anglican, by the way. Hmm. They didn't usually rally their parishioners to the revolutionary cause, but. <laughs> <laughs> Rome, the dragon, the headquarters of tyranny and persecution, still persecutes the true saints, as is true in France and other popish countries. And such tyranny is apparent also in Great Britain, which has become increasingly favorable to popery crushing liberty. There is now no part of the earth where learning, religion, and liberty have flourished more for the time than in the American wilderness. And then he adds this. It is not likely nor probable that God will revoke the grant he has made of this land to his church. That's the error right there. Yeah, there there it is. That's the error. His gifts as well as calling are irrevocable. Uh, These commotions and convulsions in the British Empire may be leading to the fulfillment of such prophecies as relate to his Babylon's downfall and overthrow Mm. and to the future glory and prosperity of Christ's church. It will soon be said and acknowledged that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Mm. Lord and of his Christ. He's (laughs) post-millennial. And then here's the Harvard president and Congregationalist Minister Samuel Langdon before the New Hampshire General Court in 1788. Harvard's president. The the title is The Republic of the Israelites, an Example to the American States. Text, Deuteronomy 4, verses 5 through 8. If I am not mistaken, instead of the 12 tribes of Israel, we may substitute the 13 states of the American Union. And see this application plainly offering itself. I always love it when they say plain. It's it's (laughs) obvious or it's plain. You know they're hiding (laughs) the fact that it's not. That as God, in the course of his kind providence, hath given you an excellent constitution of government, founded on his most rational, equitable, and liberal principles, by which all that liberty is secured which a people can reasonably claim, and you are empowered to make righteous laws for promoting public order and good morals, and as he has moreover given you by his Son Jesus Christ, who is far superior to Moses, a complete revelation of his will, and a perfect system of true religion, plainly delivered in the sacred writings. It will be your wisdom in the eyes of the nations, he's telling this to the court, the New Hampshire General Court, and your true interest and happiness to conform your practice in the strictest manner to the excellent principles of your government, adhere faithfully to the doctrines and commands of the gospel, and practice every public and private virtue. By this you will increase in numbers, wealth, and power, and obtain reputation and dignity among the nations, whereas the contrary conduct will make you poor, distressed, and contemptible. The last 